Hey everybody, thanks for joining us. Good evening. Welcome to Jack Straw. Welcome to Jack Straw on the internet as well if you're joining us online. My name is Levi Fuller. I manage the artist residency program here at Jack Straw Cultural Center. One of those is our writers program, which is what we're here to celebrate. Um, I want to start by saying that uh, today we meet on the lands of the Duwamish, Duquamish, and Muckleshoot nations and other Coast Salish peoples past and present. The staff, board, and artists of Jack Straw Cultural Center acknowledge that we're living, creating, working, and playing on the traditional lands of the first people of Seattle and the Salish Sea. And we honor them and the land itself with deep gratitude. Thank you all for being here with us tonight. Um, this is the third in our May reading series. And uh, Priscilla Long will be hosting us through the evening. Uh, it's been wonderful to work with these writers here in our studios, in our inboxes, in their inboxes, lots of emails flying back and forth. Um, but now we get to get them out into the world. And it starts with this, but we'll have readings at Folk Life, we'll have readings at other venues around the community over the course of the year. We'll have a reading at the big downtown library in November, so stay tuned. And um, yeah, find out what we're up to. Follow us on all the places. And our podcast will start coming out probably in the summer or fall, featuring uh, interviews and recordings from these readings. So make sure you're uh, following along with us. And you can just subscribe to those podcasts, and then you don't have to think about it again until it just pops into your podcast feed. Uh, I also want to thank our funders who make these programs possible, uh, the UDistrict Partnership, Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, For Culture, Washington State Arts Commission, the National Endowment for the Arts, Arts Fund, Lester and Phillips Epstein Foundation, and of course our individual contributors. Thank you to all of our individual contributors of any size. We really do appreciate it. And um, with that, I will hand it over to our fearless curator, Priscilla Long. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Levi, and thank you, Joan Rabinowitz, um, and thank you, the engineers, um, <laughs> for making Jack Straw this uh, completely vital um, art center in our region. Um, so, <clears throat> I'd like to start with quotes. So here's a quote. The poet Ann Waldman wrote, language does more than merely communicate and express. It arrives, it manifests, it is a relationship. And then also, I've been reading the architect Louis Kahn, and um, he wrote, a work of art is an offering of art. So um, thank you for being here to receive this language and this art. And um, I also include those coming in from Facebook and YouTube. So the first reader is Jim Cantu. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and um, Jim is a poet who also writes um, prose and personal essays. His, his work appears in the anthology Writing the Land, Windblown, which is, I think, if I have it right, it's an anthology of um, conserved lands. And also in the anthology in Sochi in which is um, a hundred years of Latinx um, poetry. And in Raven Chronicles <laughs> and in other, in other places. And also um, he is a, was a writer in residence for La Sala's La Cochina event. He graduated from the Artist Trust Literary Edge program. Um, Jim produces a Latin music and public affairs program Sabor for Community Radio, which is um, KBCS 91.3, and you can, I think every Saturday, um, you can tune in to Jim. And so, and he works at El Centro. So please welcome Jim Cantu. Uh, thank you, Priscilla, uh, for your mentorship in the, in the program. Uh, I want to thank Levi and the whole uh, Jack Straw team. Uh, this is an amazing group of writers that I've had the honor to share time with. Um, I want to thank you all for coming out, and you all at, out in the Netherlands, either Ethernet, um, uh, for joining us. 
Um, my first poem, uh, I'm going to read several different poems. The first one, from several years ago, I was visiting the Trade and Convention Center, and um, it's called Tragic Transgression. I look at the sculpture, is that the correct term? Closer inspection shows it to be the part of some building, torn from another's house of worship. I'm in awe at its beauty, but deeply disturbed by its presence. Did the artists making homage to their gods in that far off place know that their act of devotion would be ripped from the walls for the idle amusement of non-believers half a world away? A line not so fine between admiration and obliteration. <laughs> the story of La Virgen de Guadalupe appearing to the simple peasant Juan Diego is an enduring symbol throughout Latin America. But another version is believed by many as well. This is the story of the goddess Donatzin, a Texcoco prince, and a bargain to save a way of life. Sacred Mother Tonatzin. Counting back, our counting started five centuries before the birth of your Christ. Honor, sacred four corners, and the center of five. Four groups of five, we count in twenties, not tens. Watching the stars, tracing their movements, celestial bodies marking time, calendars closely defined from time of this creation, el quinto sol, the fifth sun, time to plant, time to harvest, time to worship, offer our thanks to our gods, homage and sacrifice, Tepeyac temple raised to honor Mother Tonatzin, gifts in tribute, necklace of maize flowers, golden circles, sacred tortillas, food we share with the gods, and our lifeblood, we honor you, our mother. Texcoco Prince, Tlacatecatl, general, commanding warriors. Mother Tonatzin, hear my prayer. Aliens from the east, over a hundred thousand killed by their black death. Should we join the many kingdoms who have aligned with them? Can we trust them? Join to defeat the Mexicas, those they call Aztecs. Bolster their small band with our tens of thousand warriors. End the tyranny. Victory is ours. Our time, Mexica calendar, to Atzemotli, 13 cattle, Cuatliwi, Cuatliwi. First tonali of the first trecena, day and time of the eagle, your year, 1531. Comforting warmth of victory cooled over the 10 years since the Mexica's defeat. Sweet blossoms of success turned to bitter ash. Noble princesses married to Spaniards to seal false bargains. Sacred temples raised to gaping wounds in hallowed ground. In winning, did we lose ourselves? To speak old ways is forbidden. To carry on old traditions is forbidden. To worship our gods is forbidden. Tongues torn from mouths, punished by torture, dismemberment, burning death. Sacred Mother Donatzin, have you forsaken us? Hear this plea from your Texcoco prince. Are these aliens even human? Their God does not feed off normal sacrifices, gifts of food or blood, exchanging our life to sustain our God's quick, swift sacrifice. No, their God's feast on our anguish. Their efforts prolong our agony. 
their God's treasure, our torture. Our Texcoco prince hears the words of Mother Tonatzin and answers. Yes, Mother, you have learned about these foreigners by watching from afar. Yes, all people honor the mother. Yes, I will help save our people. I will take the tale you told me to their head priest. On the site of your old temple at Tepeyac, servants of this new God will build a shrine, a church to honor the mother. I take them a sign of your lasting love for our people, a sign the aliens cannot ignore, a bridge between old and new. Yes, Mother Donatzin, I will learn their ways, their language. I will teach others to pass on our old ways hidden in their new. I will take a name in their tongue, Juan Diego. Our Texcoco prince did as his goddess instructed and became Juan Diego. And he prayed in her new temple. Madre Santa, Nuestra Madre, dame tu bendición. And whispered, Mother Tonatzin. Um, I, I write a lot of like historical stuff, and this is from more, more contemporary times, relatively speaking. Um, a flock of vampires. When do we stand up? How far do we go to protect our rights and freedoms? What about our neighbors' rights? Or people a thousand miles away on our southern border? Let me tell you a story of mi gente. Nuestro gente del Valle, though we each come from our own Valle. This is the story of someone who stood up. But do I have the right to tell our stories? What is history but one person's point of view? These are true events we do not hear about often. Let's set the time frame. 1821, Mexico wins freedom from Spain. 1829, Mexico abolishes slavery. But some white immigrants in the Mexico state of Texas begin a movement to start an independent slave-owning country. 1836, Texas declares independence from Mexico. 1846, the US invades Mexico, and after two years of battle, overruns Mexico City. You must remember the song. From the halls of Montezuma. Well, that's the war. 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo grants US over half of Mexico's territory. Juan Nepomuceno Cortina Jose Ochoa, red robber of the Rio Grande, or Robin Hood of the Valle Rio Grande. The Cortinas were a rich family owning property on both sides of the new US-Mexico border. Juan fought the Yankee horde when they invaded his country in the mid-1840s. He continued his fight for his community in the newly established US territory. But promises of full citizenship and equal rights were dashed by land swindles, arsons, and assassinations. Racial profiling and police violence against people of color are sadly centuries old practices. Cortina stopped a sheriff from brutalizing a Mexican American citizen. How do you respect law enforcement that doesn't respect you? In 1859, in desperation, he and a group of like-minded citizens took control of the city of Brownsville, Texas. Cortina published a proclamation in the local newspaper calling for equal treatment of Mexican-American citizens and the protection of basic civil rights. Cortina noted that a flock of vampires in the guise of men 
came and scattered themselves in our settlements without any capital except the corrupt heart and the most perverse intentions. Cortina went on to provide support on both sides of the border. He fought on the side of Union troops in the US Civil War. He led a group of vaqueros for Don Benito Juarez at the Battle of Puebla against the French. Sadly, he died in Mexico City, prisoner of dictator Porfirio Diaz. We've heard the expression that history just shows us that we cannot learn from the past. Over 160 years later, another flock of vampires in the guise of humans have descended upon our settlements to steal our basic rights as citizens. They want to bring down the foundational pillars of our democracy. Charging a fee to vote is no longer legal, but making it more difficult for some people to vote is legal. Nearly 20 million voters have been removed from voter registration lists, many with the name Garcia or Chin or with African American ancestry. Texas, New Mexico, and Georgia lead the nation in shutting down polling places. And guess whose neighborhoods get excluded? Convenient drop-off boxes are being replaced with voting centers far away from neighborhoods of color. In the last major election, many inner city residents stood in line for hours just to cast their vote. Those flocks of vampires want to drain the blood and political power of us all. How will we stand against them? Will we exercise our right to vote? I'll stand up. Will you? When do we stand up? Um, one last piece, kind of from a more personal note. Um, I had the, the wonderful good fortune and blessing to share my life with uh, a, a remarkable lady. This is my song of solitude. Let me sing to you a song of solitude. Darn the torn threads of damaged dreams. Piece together the puzzle of my shattered heart. We promised each other forever a vow taken with pomp and celebration before family and friends. Nearly four decades, how did they pass so quickly? Was I paying attention to the wrong things or the wrong people? Her surprising and soft touch on my neck, a reminder of her love, so hungry for human contact that I grow my hair long, pretending that some part of her lingers. Another night of broken promises forgotten whispers of desire, spoken only to myself. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Um, next is Julene Tripp Weaver. And she is a uh, poet, essayist, memoirist. Uh, she's a psychotherapist who worked in AIDS services for 21 years. And she's certified in the wise woman tradition and wild crafts to make herbal remedies. Um, her third book of poems, Truth Be Bold, Serenading Life and Death in the Age of AIDS, has won all kinds of prizes. And it is a, a incredibly powerful book. Um, so um, she's an art activist in the Seattle chapter of Through Positive Eyes Project. I mean, though, th no, Through, sorry, Through Positive Eyes Project. And she has essays in all kinds of places, including the anthology 
but you don't look sick. The real life adventures of fibro bitches, lupus warriors, and other superheroes battling invisible illness. Please welcome Jolene Tripweek. <laughs> Thank you, Priscilla. I want to thank the Jack Straw Program, the people who have enabled this to be here. I'm really thrilled to be a participant with Priscilla this year. So thank you for selecting me, and thank you all the technical staff. Avoiding burnout in a 365, 24-7 work environment. On December 29th, 1989, I went to the STD clinic for my HIV test result. It was positive. The news hit like a tidal wave. In process of relocating to Seattle from New York, working a survival secretarial job, I absorbed this knowledge. A retrovirus lived inside my body. Life sped up. Everything became urgent. HIV was a motivational force. Accepted into a master's program at the Leadership Institute of Seattle, LEOS, I was eager to start a new career. I longed to make a difference, to find heart satisfaction, to help others through my daily efforts. Thus, my goal became to work with people living with HIV and AIDS. What better way to contribute, to learn about AIDS, to learn how people died? Three months I searched for work. To my great fortune, I was offered a secretarial position at the Northwest AIDS Foundation, NWAF. My counseling degree would be an asset for a clinical position. I could apply internally for jobs offering direct support, direct contact with clients in either their case management program or their housing program. Determined, I'd make this work. It was a coming home to my people and the beginning of a long career with meaning beyond what I could have expected this lifetime. AIDS service organizations started as a grassroots movement. The gay community was in crisis, forced to rally for our sick and dying young men. It took till January 1986 before President Ronald Reagan first said the acronym AIDS in public. Stressed, the community came together formed AIDS service organizations, and initiated a political movement to advocate for our loved ones, brothers, lovers, family, friends. Our federal government did nothing those early years. For my clinical internship, I moved into a part-time position before graduation. I applied and was hired as a client advocate. <coughs> A year later, I was hired into case management. This was heart-based work. Once, I told my team I did the work out of love. Coworkers questioned what I meant. A straight man challenged me, saying, that was impossible. But I was at peace. This was my destined life. My life bonded into this work. A professional, I didn't share my status with clients. It was their time. My role was to serve, not tell my story. A basic ethical tenant in psychology. Careful, I chose who I told. Gay men who were open about living with HIV felt the safest. They understood. My status was private information. I had no desire to be a public spokesperson. Over time, the circle of people I shared my status with expanded. Learning helped me stay strong. And yes, there were bad days. 
the day I sat with two clients, each of whom had been raped. The times clients lashed out or broke down. My life was threatened, my body and mind assaulted, my patience tried, my heart bruised, but I did not break, I wilted. But I did movement work to revive my body cell deep. I kept a list of the dead, made art, wrote poems, pulled tarot cards. I ran a grief circle for our case management team to say goodbye to clients who died. Found ways to survive helpless days. Kept myself buoyed despite strong winds of pain and suffering. I learned to sit with tragedy, to offer what I could, to set limits. I had to take care of myself against the expectations and demands of a 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week work environment. In my personal time, I took lessons from the ancient oracle, threw coins for an I Ching reading when I needed advice. With ancient, stressed clients, I listened and did the lunar breath, a long, slow exhale from the back of my throat that I'd learned from continuum movement. It changed the physical atmosphere and clients settled, calmed down. One man with a suitcase full of paperwork he hadn't opened, benefits delayed, was having a panic attack. We opened his mail together. I breathed, step by step. We found what he needed and completed his forms. The next morning, I faxed the forms to my contact at the Department of Social and Health Services, DSHS. His benefits were renewed. The secret, my secret, was to foster connections inside the larger organizations I nurtured relationships with to make it easier for my clients. One man at DSHS was my go-to to get things done that otherwise might take weeks. He answered his phone. I'd fax the paperwork and he'd process it fast, even for someone not in his district, against the rules. But he had a long history and he knew the computer system. Washington State, for those of you who don't know, has a spend down, meaning clients have to meet an expense quota from out of pocket every three to six months. This meant tracking paperwork and sending in paid receipts before their benefits could be restarted. This anxiety-producing policy plagues people dependent on Medicaid. My contacts were reliable for years. I dreaded the day any of them would retire. It was a precious thing to have an insider help tackle the complications of basic coverage. The secrets to working with overworked burnt out workers with bulging caseloads. Be nice, ask with a polite voice. Thank them for their work and time. Breathe, don't get pushy, sweetness works. There are so many rules and the systems are set up to rule people out. So, the, so use basic manners and they'll be willing to help you figure out how to get what you need. Coaching clients who went to DSHS or Social Security on their own, I said, they are your friend. They want to help you. If you go with this attitude, you will have your needs met, your questions answered. Appreciate them with a smile, say thank you. Rewards from the work came in small moments. When I, what I did for a client proved successful. It felt good when things worked out and clients were able to get what they needed because they met the guidelines and rules. 
I went out of my way to write letters to programs and administra administrators when their rules weren't in clients' favor. The, politi the political part of the work, to be an advocate. At times, due to the systems or to the lack of funds or resources, I had to lower my expectations, had to explain the rules to the client. Politeness made it easier, but it was painful when the system didn't favor the client. There are long-term non-progressors, but I was not one. My CD4 count, the immune cells that protect a body from infections, my body, and from opportunistic infections, went down despite the herbs, despite the alternative studies. Still, I trusted my body. When first diagnosed, I questioned, would I replicate my father's early death? When first diagnosed, but after 11 years living with HIV, I passed my father's death age, 49. Passing that measure was huge. It gave me strength. I still missed him. I used to believe he protected me. Maybe he still did. In this milieu, I watched people, saw how AIDS besieged their bodies, how they died. I built a collection of resources, expanded my personal healing force. I created a scrapbook of hope for my healing journey. My life force and time invested, I gave from my drive to live. Clients, coworkers, and friends died. But I maintained, stressed, because all was not well. I had swollen lymph glands, skin flare-ups, constant itching. My body felt the expanding virus within me. There was nothing to do but keep going. Any person who works within human services, whether social work, education, health care, mental health, housing, prison or forensic, is subject to secondary trauma. Self-care was an important topic at work with trainings. In the 1990s, death was a daily occurrence. Our caseload changed because of death more than any other factor. Secondary trauma is built in with social service work. With AIDS work, we had the added stress, stress of daily deaths. We developed a second sense, a hyped up capacity for what harm can happen in any situation. Witness to stigma and breakdowns, we see the worst and the best in our fellow humans. This shadow side is lodged in our consciousness like a plague. Hike to the top of a mountain Friends enjoy the view, but you wonder, how many jumped off this cliff? Drive across any bridge and think, how many jumped to their death? In a city alley, you eye the dark doorways for drug deals, murders, bodies. You hesitate to enter public restrooms or walk through a tunnel. Couches or beds on Craigslist are likely filled with bed bugs. Rape is a given. Our nervous system on high alert, frazzled. Our body contracted. What we've seen lurks wherever we go. The pleasant persona we carry. The love for clients. How we work to soothe the wrongs. A steady beat. Breathe. Keep dark humor quiet. It's a way to withstand assault. We stand like a teacher in a classroom, prepared for a shooter to enter with an AR-15. There is a hopelessness under the surface, a question, what would I do? Would I survive? 
at night, wondering about clients behind closed doors, in the park, under a bridge, in jail, in skilled nursing, wondering, are they safe? We witness their pain, their ragged bodies, their tears, the repercussions their life presents. For 18 years, I served clients, gave my time and energy to others, living with this virus like me. Thank you. Nancy M. Burrow is an author and performing poet. <clears throat> Her writing amplifies the experiences and stories of East Africa, East African immigrants in an authentic way that also encompasses black diasporans' complex relationship with culture, tradition, language, gender dynamics and race. <clears throat> her style involves uplifting her culture by incorporating her native language, Swahili, and rooting her stories in their cultural and political context. Nancy has a BA in creative writing from the University of Washington and is a 2023 Hugo House Fellow as well as being a 2023 Jack Straw Fellow. So please welcome Nancy Inborough. Hello, I'm Nancy Inborough. I want to thank Jack Straw, Priscilla, and my fellow cohort members. I've enjoyed listening to your work. Um, so today I'm going to read uh, something from my ongoing novel called Sauti, which means the voice. And it's a story about a performing poet who loses her voice. Uh, she's an immigrant from Kenya and is on a journey to finding her voice both physically and figuratively. Thank you. <coughs> Sauti. Nuru starred on the hospital bed. The halter monitor beeped erratically she was bombarded by the memories of that morning. Her chest felt constricted. Her breathing got heavier. She felt as if something was lodged in her throat, and her hands attempted to disarm the invisible restraint. She became frantic. Her father had always told her, Dalili ambua ni mawingu. And though she did not want to admit it, every cell in her body screamed something was amiss. It was a feeling that she regularly experienced, but had learned to shelf away. Immigrants had no time to rest or even get sick. A nurse rushed into the room and attempted to make her lie down. But her cries only became more hysterical. The nurse grabbed a needle and took a colorless vial from her pocket and injected it. Once the needle was full, she flicked it with her finger and proceeded to inject it into the sailing bag attached to Nuru's hand. Nuru's grip began to loosen. Her vision became blurry as she floated into unconsciousness. Nuru's eyes fluttered open. The slightly open shades indicated that the sun had already set. She wiggled her fingers, which still felt cramped. Her body still felt limp. Any attempts to move failed. Doctors and nurses filled, filtered in and out of the room, scribbling notes from the machine. She had had one nurse mention that they had called her emergency contact. As an international student, she had no family in the States that she knew of, unless... Her uncle Simon, who was currently residing in Kenya, had bought a ticket, flown to the States, and was en route to the hospital within the last 24 hours. It was highly unlikely. There had to be a mistake. They must have gotten her file mixed up with somebody else's. 
She was subjected to more tests. Her doctor asked her to open her mouth as wide as he, uh, sorry. She was subjected to more tests. The doctor asked her to open her mouth wide as he used a small flashlight to inspect it. He then prompted her to stick her tongue out. Say ah, the doctor prompted. She opened her mouth and contorted it, but no words came out. It's good to see that you are finally relaxed. We had to sedate you when the young lady brought you in. She said that you had a meltdown. Can you explain to me why? He asked, pausing for a moment. Nuru knew the young woman the doctor alluded to had to be her roommate, Claire. She would not be surprised that the girl bolted the minute she got her signed in. Claire was extremely wary of governmental organizations or institutions linked to them. Nuru opened her mouth. Her lips moved, but no words came out. She cleared her throat again and attempted to speak, but nothing came out. The young lady stated that you haven't said a word in a month. Is this true? Nuru nodded. Have you been experiencing any pain around your throat or chest area? Nuru shook her head from side to side. The doctor continued to ask more questions and scribbled some notes on his notepad. Nuru's leg tapped anxiously on the bed. All she could think was how much being in the hospital would cost her. As is, she could barely afford to keep afloat. Though her visa required her to have health insurance, she knew it was only useful to cover basic doctor appointments and not overnight stays. Once he was done, the nurses proceeded to take her temperature and blood pressure. She looked up when she had a knock at the door that was slightly ajar. She froze as she thought she saw a ghost. An elderly black man with a woman walked in. His features mirrored hers, her obscenely large forehead and that iconic Waiyaki striking nose. He was the spitting image of her father, only younger and a tad shorter. Ruru, oh my God, he said as he proceeded to wrap his arms around her. I don't know if you remember me. The last time I saw you, ulikuwa mshana mdogo. Then she felt it, the crack in her throat, a sound so foreign to her since her arrival. She did not know why she cried, if it was because this was the first time someone had sincerely embraced her since her arrival, or was it because he was the spitting image of her late father, or was it simply because someone had actually cared? She did not know for how long they embraced until they had the awkward clearing of the throat from the woman who had now moved to the corner. Ruru, I don't know if you remember my wife Achola, her uncle Richie said as he introduced her. How could she not remember Aunt Achola? She was legendary. Though she was too young to remember her face, she remembered the stories they told about her the woman who caused her uncle to leave his family. She was a tall, dark-skinned dark beauty. Her flawless dark chocolate skin was complemented by her curvy figure and athletic physique. She had an accentuated bottom and her chest was smaller. I'm glad you're all here, the doctor said. I have some good news and bad news concerning Nuru's health. Which would you like to hear first? The good news, her uncle replied. Well, Nuru is in perfectly good shape. Actually, much more than people her age, the doctor said as he flipped through Nuru's file. What is the bad news then, her uncle asked. After conducting some rudimentary tests, it would seem that Nuru has selective mutism. What does that even mean, Aunt Achola asked. We suspect that her inability to talk is triggered by some psychological trauma, the doctor explained. 
So you're basically saying that this is all in her head. And Tachola threw back. Honey. Uncle Richie reprimanded as he proceeded to reach out for Aunt Achola's hand. He squeezed it as if sending her a hidden message. It's the truth. The doctor basically said that there's no physical evidence of her illness, she replied. How long will it last? Uncle Richie asked as he stared at Nuru with concern. It all depends. It's unusual to see such cases in adults. It mostly occurs in children. The current theory is if she's able to overcome the trigger, she should be able to regain her ability to speak again, the doctor replied. Was this how it felt to be betrayed by one's own body? To repeat a command only to have your body fail to execute? She thought it cruel that an armor she had often felt was invincible as she jumped down the jacaranda trees, scaled the neighbor's walls, and fell off bicycles had finally cracked at the ripe age of 24. With all the new information, she felt like her mind was trapped in a speeding train that seemed to see no end. Words formed in her mind. She opened her mouth, ready to recite the words that longed to escape her. I will not be silenced, floated in her mind. Trapped in a body by the virtue of her own mind, prisoner enslaved, or maybe restraint, she continued. Stuck in an illusion, duped by the dealer of life that I had any real power, only to realize I had been dealt a bad hand. She imagined herself back on stage, her deep vibrato echoing in each corner. She imagined the energy emanating from the audience as they waited in anticipation. She knew where she would add a dramatic pose. Smiling, she visualized how she would hunch her body and change her voice to mimic a prisoner. She imagined the audience captivated by her words and the cheers of applause that would follow. But as she opened her mouth, nothing followed. Her mouth betrayed her. Silence was all that echoed. She had heard of amputees and how they still felt the sensation of their amputated limbs long after they were gone. <clears throat> she could still feel her voice lingering, a ghost of her performance past taunting her. She had nothing of value to offer in this country. Her voice was all she had. Her visa and scholarship were contingent on her ability to perform. A conversation from the hallway filled the room. Her uncle and aunt looked like mimes. Her aunt's hands flared right and left while her uncle paced back and forth through the slightly open door. She listened. Look, I feel bad for her, but we need to distance ourselves from this. She is not our priority, her aunt Achola said. How can you say that? That is my brother's only daughter. She is my concern. <coughs> you mean the brother who joined your family as they kicked us out? The day we left, I thought we were done with all of them. Look at her. She has no one. She can't even talk. She looks like she hasn't had a decent meal in a while. This is America. Everyone needs to watch out for themselves. We can't afford to take her in. She needs us, honey. Please do this for me. She literally showed up from nowhere. We don't know what she's caught up in. If this is a juju or a village power situation, I want nothing to do with it, Richie. You hear me? I don't want anyone or anything to jeopardize what we have. That is my niece. You can't expect me to just abandon her. I'm helping her whether you like it or not. Then you better find another place to live because as long as you are helping that girl, I want nothing to do with you, Aunt Achola said. She grabbed her handbag and proceeded to leave Nuru's uncle in the hallway. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Caitlin Tier is right here. She's um, joining us from Bellingham. Um, <clears throat> and where is she? Is she going to be there? Oh, there she is. <laughs> and um, Caitlin writes on the. Oh, yeah. Um, hit record on your end, don't forget. <laughs> Um, so Caitlin writes on the love um, contradictions and fears among raising small children and climate change. Her essays have been published in Orion, Electric Lit, Catapult, and other places. Her nonfiction was listed as notable in the 2017 Best American Essays. And she got a special mention in the 2018 um, Pushcart Prize Anthology, and her essays have received Prairie Schooner's Bernice Sloat Award and Fourth Genre's Michael Steinberg um, Essay Prize. That's a really a big deal. And she was a Kenyan Review Writers Workshop Peter Taylor feller, Fellow, and she's a regular contributor to the Plowshares blog, and she holds an MFA from Western Washington University where she teaches writing and she's joining us from Bellingham. Um, and don't forget to turn on your record, Caitlin. And <laughs> please welcome Caitlin Tier. Thank you. And I am recording. I'm very sorry to not be physically present. I'm recovering from a COVID infection. But it has been an honor to listen to the work shared by my fellow cohort members this evening. And I'm grateful to Jack Straw and to Priscilla and the team who has assisted me with the technology to meet remotely. I have two young children and much of my recent writing has explored motherhood and the climate crisis. This is an excerpt from an essay called Watching the Clock. Watching the Clock. My daughter is learning to tell time. At three years old, she stands in front of the oven, hopping on one foot, looking up at the blue digits on the stovetop clock. She can read off the numbers, but can't yet name the minutes greater than 20. It's six, five, eight, she'll say. Is it bedtime? In the morning, the ring around the face of her okay to wake clock glows yellow as 6 a.m. approaches, then turns green to let her know when she can start her day. When she is negotiating more screen time, she'll keep her cake just five more minutes. And in the kitchen, while we're making supper, she'll shout, freeze. And my spouse and I will hold very still in exaggerated poses until she reverses her time stop spell by yelling, unfreeze. From the back seat where she sits beside her baby brother on the way to swim lessons, she asks, are we going to be late? Until a few months ago, every memory my daughter recounted happened yesterday. Now she speaks of the past in terms of last week, last month, last year. And what she has already intuited about the future is that time runs out. Sometimes when I am tucking her into bed, she'll turn to me, her face searching mine in the dim glow of the nightlight and ask in a voice that cuts through the shushing of the white noise machine, Mama, when will you die? A check of the climate clock tells me that as I write this, there are six years, 313 days two hours, 28 minutes, and three seconds left to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The makers of the climate clock argue that its 15 digits are the most important numbers in the world. Earth has a deadline, they announced, when they reprogrammed the metronome, a 62-foot digital clock in New York City's Union Square to display the countdown until the moment when the worst effects 
of global warming become irreversible i can watch the seconds tick by on a bright red banner at the top of the project's official website i can hear my daughter reading off the clock's numbers six three one three like the busy people walking in union square i can feel the clock's red glare looming overhead as i go about my day while caring for my children or working on a lesson plan or making dinner i am watching the clock marking my own countdown when time runs out my children will be 10 and 7. where'd you rocks come from another of my daughter's bedtime questions one that tests the limits of what i remember learning about geology in school let's learn about rocks together i say the next morning Seated at the kitchen table in front of my laptop, I pull up our public library's catalog to request several picture books about the rock cycle for my daughter. And for me, Marcia Bjornrud's Timefulness, How Thinking Like a Geologist Can Help Save the World. I hope the book might offer perspective for reframing my climate anxiety, or at the very least, help me nurture my daughter's curiosity about the natural world. Rock by rock, Bjornrud says, geologists map time. In doing so, the geochronologist plotted the story of Earth's earliest days, a record of how it transformed over billions of years. In between fixing snacks and answering work emails, I try to contemplate these times, but I keep getting interrupted. Geologists may speak of epics, yet parenting has so contracted the timescale by which I measure life that I speak of it in much smaller increments. It's hard to hold in mind the immensity of planetary history when the demands of the present feel so immediate and overwhelming. And thinking about the uncertain future my children face is almost more than I can bear. Among the problems Bjorn Rudd identifies with Western conceptions of time is the pervasiveness of time denial, or chronophobia, an ignorance of the planet's past and a reluctance to take a clear-eyed look at its future complicate efforts to address climate change. In response, Bjorn Rudd advocates for what she calls a polytemporal worldview, one that holds together the various rates of change that take place on our planet, some fast, some slow. Even if I can't fathom these times, motherhood at least has prepared me for a polytemporal worldview. My children are always changing, and the passage of time feels paradoxical, fast and slow. A polytemporal worldview, Bjorn Rudd says, may help with another kind of chronophobia, the fear of death, a fear that is newly present in my daughter's consciousness a fear I'm experiencing anew through her questions. Reading Bjorn Rudd, I practice thinking about time like a geologist, but mostly I can manage only to think about it like a mother. Did the dinosaurs die and turn into dirt? My daughter asked from the back seat in the days that follow my grandmother's funeral. Some did, I said and some turned into fossils. Then she asked, when I die, will I turn back into dirt? We all will, I hear my spouse say, because I can't. And then no one will ever see us again, she asked, a question that feels hard and heavy as a rock. Then quieter, she says, I don't like dying. I don't like it either. My attempts to provide age-appropriate explanations about what happens when we die and reassurances about how much time we have left feel false and inadequate. In moments like these, reminded of our mortality, I wish I had more power over time. I feel the childish urge to freeze it so that we might remain together 
in a state of suspended animation. Whether I am watching the clock as it ticks down to bedtime, or I am so immersed in playing with my children that I've forgotten to mind it, whether I desire more time with my children or more time for myself, whether I feel time's passage is too fast or too slow, I never have enough of it. Time runs out. The makers of the climate clock were inspired by the doomsday clock, a clock which has been ticking my whole life. <coughs> for decades, it was the cover art for the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist and its nuclear non-proliferation effort. And it has since become a universally recognized symbol for assessing the risk of global catastrophe. I was born with three minutes left on the doomsday clock. That was before the grassroots nuclear freeze movement, before the fall of the Iron Curtain, before the signing of the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, before the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Events which turned back the clock to 17 minutes to midnight. My daughter was born with two minutes on the clock, owing not just to nuclear armament, but also to the interconnected threats of bioterrorism and global warming. On the day I gave birth to my son, the bulletin's president announced that the clock was now set at 100 seconds to midnight. The official statement reads, quote, the clock remains the closest it has ever been to civilization ending apocalypse because the world remains stuck in an extremely dangerous moment. A question on the frequently asked questions page of the bulletin's website puts it this way. Which is the greater threat, nuclear weapons or climate change? At the end of the day, trying to answer the question is like standing around in a burning house, arguing about whether it is better to die of smoke inhalation or from a falling timber. I keep meeting my children in these midnight hours. If the earth is a house that's burning, there is no fire escape. I can hear the smoke detectors blaring as I try to rock my babies back to sleep, patting their backs in the age-old rhythm of reassurance. Last summer, I noticed a meme circulating during heat waves. In it, a child whined, this is the hottest summer of my life. In response, a parent warned, this is the coldest summer of the rest of your life. This dialogue is often superimposed on an image of Bart and Homer Simpson. Aesthetics aside, the meme is a sobering reminder of what's at stake when it comes to global warming. And yet, it promotes a kind of climate nihilism that I'm trying to resist. My thoughts about this image are connected to another parenting meme that circulates each summer. One I've come to resent for what it implies about keeping time. Of its many iterations, nearly always, there is a sunlit child playing near water. The text reads something like, we only have 18 summers together. The 18 summers meme is a kind of countdown that puts pressure on parents, but especially mothers. A good mother knows to make every moment count, an imperative that haunts me. These memes illustrate what is, for me, one of the most difficult parts of parenting. I am always on the clock. I have come to associate the clock with guilt. Mom guilt and climate guilt. I feel guilty for the time I spend working instead of with my children. Guilty when I resent how mothering keeps me from my work. Guilty when I choose extractive, time-saving conveniences instead of more sustainable, albeit slower, methods of managing our household. I live in a perpetual state of time scarcity, one that's heightened by the existential threat of climate change. Maternal time, I'm finding, is at odds with Western constructs of time. Some forms of labor simply take the time they take. They cannot be optimized for profit. 
like making art or engaging in activism the work of caregiving is inefficient and undervalued it's a conflict exacerbated by capitalism patriarchy and white supremacy forces that imperil the planet while writing this i'm interrupted by the sound of my daughter's bedroom door creaking open it's not yet late but it's past her bedtime by the time she calls downstairs for me i am already there she jumps into my arms as i approach the top step and wraps herself around me as i carry her back to bed she asks for another story earlier we'd watched the beginning of frozen a film we have never finished because there is a wolf that chases snarling after the princess in her sleigh a scene that frightens my daughter so much she can no longer keep watching when this happens i try to soothe her fear i try to explain to her that this is how stories work that things get hard and scary but that usually things work out well in the end but she is not lured by my promises of a happily ever after so the kingdom remains frozen the film thaws on screen neither of us knows what happens next which is another way of saying anything could happen we lie on her bed together face to face our hands touching tell me a story she says and so i do the end i say when it's over time for sleep now but she protests she wants to linger in the world of story she doesn't want me to leave but mama she says it isn't the end yet how we tell time and the stories we tell about it matter when it comes to climate action there is a productive tension between metaphors that remind us that time is running out and those that remind us that there is still time in which to act. Bjorn Rudd cautions against watching the clock for midnight. It is a mistake to think of planetary processes as moving only very slowly, when in fact some shifts can happen quite rapidly. She writes, if the 4.5 billion year story of the Earth is scaled to a 24 hour day, all of human history would transpire in the last fraction of a second before midnight but this is the wrong-headed and even irresponsible way to understand our place in time not only is this metaphor disempowering it also minimizes the impact that humanity can make in a relatively short amount of time worse still it makes the end seem inevitable after all she asks what happens after midnight? The question reminds me of Rebecca Solnit's latest climate project called Not Too Late, which explicitly appeals to making the most of our remaining time and draws on the work of black futurists who insist on the radical power of optimism and imagination of envisioning a future of global flourishing. I keep trying to remind myself that even on the doomsday clock, it's possible to turn back time. I learned to tell time by moving the red hands of a Judy clock. Seated at a table in my first place grade classroom, I spun the minute hand and watched the clock's red and green gears turn as the hours advanced around the cheerful yellow face. I could spin the hands counterclockwise too and watch the gears of time reverse. Now that I'm teaching my daughter to tell time, I'm realizing there's more to it than just reading off numbers from the clock. Soon she will be able to read the climate clock's countdown and determine for herself what it means. And I'll listen to her tell her stories about it. Her fourth summer was perhaps the hottest, coldest summer of her life. It was the summer of temporary tattoos, hours spent snipping out colorful cartoons with child-sized scissors and applying them to her skin and mine. Hundreds of little things that marked us then wore off. A thermometer, a red heart, a clock. This morning before preschool, she cut out another tattoo for me, words written backwards so that they would be legible once applied. 
She placed it on the inside of my wrist, covering it with a wet cloth, which she held tenderly as she counted to 20, skipping only the number 17. She removed her hand to reveal the message on my skin. Carpe diem. I look down at my wrist now, and already it is fading. Thank you, Caitlin. That was fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you all for coming. And yeah, thank you all. Your readers were fabulous. So thank you.